Jr. Essayist, humorist, author of 22 books on subjects ranging from pro football to the English language. Mr. Blood grew up in Decatur, Georgia, where his mother urged him to be sweet. Early on, he honed the observational, that's one of his titles, he honed the observational skills and the sense of irony that make him such a widely read author and speaker, notably on NPR. In fact, if you've ever read any sports journalism, ever listened to the radio, ever read Garden and Gun magazine, where he has a regular <laughs> column, ever read Esquire, the New York Times, Atlanta Magazine, Inside Sports, Men's Journal, Condé Nast Traveler, the San Francisco Examiner, and the Atlanta Journal, you probably read or heard some of Roy Blunt's works. His essays, articles, stories, verses, and even drawings have appeared in 168 different periodicals, including, also, The New Yorker, Gourmet, Playboy, Vanity Fair, GQ, Life, TV Guide. I, I'm not going to read my whole four-page introduction, but uh, I could easily do that, and uh, it would only cover a portion of all that he has done. His work has taken him to China, Uganda, and Iceland. He has rafted the Amazon, where he was attacked by piranha, played baseball <laughs> with the Chicago Cubs, hung out with Will Chamberlain, Yogi Berra, Reggie Jackson, and the world's then oldest living lifeguard, though not all at once. He has covered Democratic and Republican conventions and presidential election nights. He has reported on the Civil Rights Movement, Elvis's funeral, the Olympics, several World Series and Super Bowls, and he has interviewed Martin Luther King Jr., Willie Nelson, Ray Charles, Satchel Paige, Joe DiMaggio, Willie Mays, Loretta Lynn, and Eudora Welty. He has publicly expressed his misgivings about every president since JFK, with the exception, for some reason, of Gerald Ford. He even gets credit for my introduction. Most of it comes from his highly entertaining website. Well, all this, plus he's a cat person. I got to see the pictures of Jimmy, his cat, who sits on his head, and it does not get any better than this, folks. Please welcome Roy Blood Jr. Thank you for that introduction, Kerry. It's always interesting what kind of uh, introduction you're going to get. I was uh, in New York. The New York Public Library has a, a uh, dinner every year called the Literary Lions Dinner, where people, 20 authors have chosen to be literary lions, and people come in and spend money to uh, sit at the table with the authors, and uh, it's a good cause and all. Uh, so I did it, and then after 20 years of that, they, or 10 years of that, the 10th anniversary Literary Lions Dinner was, uh, there were 200 Literary Lions by then, so we <laughs> lost a few, but uh, well, near, pretty nearly 2,200, and Meryl Streep once said a profound thing, I'm sure she said many profound things, but she said a profound thing to the Yale graduating class one year, which was that she said, you're leaving college now and going out into real life. And you'll find that uh, real life is not like college. Uh, real life is like high school. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sometimes the literary life is more like grammar school. Because in this case, uh, before the dinner, all of us authors were lined up in the hall outside the big dining hall, like being lined up outside the lunchroom. You know, and we were lined up alphabet. <laughs> which is kind of interesting because you don't, don't think about where you stand, uh, you know, how you fit in alphabetically with other authors. And it turns out that just because you're alphabetically close to another author doesn't mean you're going to get along with <laughs> him or her. Um, uh, I was a B, of course, and uh, I found out that I was in between Harold Bloom and Judy Bloom. <laughs> well, I'm fine with Judy, but Harold and I just did not do that. <laughs> and so uh, this was happening all up and down the line. You know, people were, uh, uh, Jays were losing interest in other Jays and going off and finding themselves among the W's and so on and so forth. And uh, there's a guy, you know, who got to be sent out into the big glittery dining hall and um, there was a guy there with a clipboard, you know, who was supposed to keep order and get everybody out just at the, exactly the right moment. 
And he was, uh, first of all, he was shushing us. And you kind of hate to be shushed when you're a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of cooperate with the problem. And so, uh, um, you know, so he tried to, not to talk. And, uh, but people were talking, and not only talking, as I say, but getting out of line. And, uh, and he could see this. And he'd be looking back, he'd be peeping into the dining hall, and looking back at us and, and saying, people, I can't do this. <laughs> if you don't, uh, if you don't get back in the lab, don't even shuffle back in the lab. And uh, so, be, as a B, I was, um, you know, pretty close to the front of the line. So he was, uh, you know, just at the right moment, he sent me out, and I walked out. And uh, it was big, he was dazzling um, room there in the library there with all the beautifully dressed people in evening clothes, and I knew what to do. I was, had been coached to walk straight to my table and I could find my head. I, on an occasion like that, I might well have left to my own devices, wander around for hours trying to find my, where I was supposed to go. But in this case, I knew exactly where to go and I was focusing, focusing on that. And, and I knew that I was going to, once I got to my table, I was going to be asked the two questions you should never ask and all. Um, how is your book coming? And how is your book doing? <laughs> but uh, I was getting for it, it was a good cause, and so I headed toward my table and I heard the voice of Barbara Walters saying, and now a humorist, a novelist, and I thought, oh, gosh, that's so sort of cool. Uh, I only ever wrote one novel, and Barbara Walters knows that I wrote a novel. That's kind of nice. uh, so I had a kind of spring in my step as I headed toward my table until I heard Barbara Walters say, and, incidentally, a very good cook. <laughs> <laughs> and that left me sort of not because, you know, I have done things uh, at night that I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up once in the New Orleans hotel room and blinked and went into the bathroom and looked in the mirror and I had this big clot of dried blood right in the middle of my forehead. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to have to change my way of living because uh, you know, I remember a lot of things from last night, but for the life of me, I don't remember getting shot. <laughs> Which is, uh, especially if you're a writer, you need to remember, you know, you need to remember things like that. There's no point in getting shot if you don't, uh, <laughs> don't know what it was like and can't use it in your work. So I was feeling kind of bad until I turned on the light and looked a little closer and realized that I had not been shot. I had uh, just slept on my complimentary mint. So, but I couldn't imagine that I had cooked for Barbara Walters and forgotten about it. I mean, the first, I thought this was the first time I'd ever seen Barbara Walters in the flesh. And boy, I'm not that good a cook. I couldn't figure out. I mean, I can cook for children and myself, basically. I'm not the kind of food that Barbara Walters is used to. I couldn't imagine why she thought I was a good cook until she finished up by saying, Nora Ephraim. Everybody applauded me. I sat down, and uh, we had gotten all out of order. And uh, this happened all, all down the alphabet. You know, everybody in the hall was introduced. So at one point, Somebody said, George Plimpton. Oh, it was Tony Randall took over halfway through the alphabet. He said, George Plimpton. And this little Indian woman walked out. <laughs> so, you know, you never know. Um, sometimes the literary life, literary recognition is not quite what it's uh, uh, cracked up to be. But I appreciate uh, being here to, in Memphis. I've been in Memphis off and on over the years, but not in quite a while. And, um, this is a nice, nice room here. I thought I would, I have this, these two books about words that came out, um, that uh, came out over the last few years, Alphabet Juice and Alphabetter Juice. Uh, I always wanted to do a book about words, because I've always thought that words are really uh, primarily oral. You know, obviously there's, written, the written word is not just oral, but uh, it's always an oral element to me in words, and uh, the, um, my mother taught me how to read by uh, sounding out the words. And reading also reading me to me from uh, Uncle Remus' stories, which had um, 
uh, phrases like to be shown, T O O B Y S H O, and uh, by and by, B I M E B Y, which I thought was just a magic way of spelling the way people say by and by. Um, so I've always been sort of uh, prejudiced in, in favor of morality in language. And, okay, so this is how this book Alphabet Jews begins. According to scholars of linguistics, the relation between a word and its meaning is arbitrary. In proof, they point to pigs. Stephen Picker, in words and his book Words and Rules, observes that pigs go oink oink in English, nuff nuff in Norwegian, <laughs> and in Russian, C H R J O C H R J O. <laughs> that may look arbitrary, as if it went something like this when you're trying to decide words. English committee member number one, what do we put down for pig noise? Member number two, whose motives are unclear. Let's name it for my uncle Oink. <laughs> <laughs> member number three, no, we need to capture more of that grunt, <laughs> grunt. A weary groan arises. Member number four, in Russia, he or she is shouted down. And the committee chairman, people, we have to move on to all these words. Have you ever tried to spell any of the various sounds that pigs make? It isn't easy. It's damn well worth trying, but eventually you have to settle on something close. Chickens being more articulate, you'll find their noises to be pretty similar the world round. Baby chicks go peep, peep in English, P-O-P-O -P -O in Spanish, and P-O-P-O -P -O in Japanese. And I'm not sure Pinker is playing fair with that C-H-R-J-O. It's not Russian letters. How am I supposed to know how Russian people or pigs pronounce it? Fortunately, by Googling Russian pigs go, I have obtained the input of an online chat person named Mr. Anonymous, who sounds like he knows what he is talking about. He writes, in Russian, pigs go H-R-O-O, H-R-O-O. Note that these are rolled R's, and the H is more of a HK sound, <laughs> like when you try to build a hoodie. Don't try and pronounce the K, just flim up the H. <laughs> That's not bad. Over the years and around the world, generation building upon generation, people have put much mimetic effort into the spelling of pig utterance. For that matter, grunt works for me. And I resent any insinuation that I have been programmed by random convention. Dictionaries in their grudging way call grunt probably imitating. You think? The word is a distinct refinement or counter-refinement of the old English grunaton. And although they parallel Greek, G-R-Y, they get a little too technical sometimes. But uh, anyway, that's what I think of as alphabet <coughs> which is uh, the, the intrinsic energy of language that uh, not only uh, conveys a, an abstract meaning but connects the meaning to physical uh, reference and, uh, and also connects language to the mouth and the word through, for instance. You ever notice that the word through starts up here and goes up straight back through your mouth. Whereas uh, the word throttle starts uh, out that way but then it gets back in the back and throttle, throttle. A like, glottal stop is like, uh, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting married in the morning. Uh, and uh, throttle, and then there's throw in. It goes into a lot of THR words in here. And um, I just love to get into all that, and to uh, get, register the, the uh, uh, physicality of language. Um, you know, I, I think that's Southern to some extent. That, uh, Southern, Southerners tend to uh, accentuate the oral element in language. Uh, I did an anthology of Southern humor a while back, and uh, people are always people ask me what Southern humor is, how it's different from uh, non-Southern. That's it. It's, it, uh, it stresses the uh, animals a lot, and also orality in the mouth and physicality. I wrote a little poem uh, which uh, sort of incorporates all those elements. It's a uh, song to oysters. It goes like this. I like to eat an uncooked oyster. Nothing slicker, nothing moister. 
Nothing's easier on your gorge or when the time comes to be sure. But not to let it too long rest within your mouth is always best. For if your mind dwells on an oyster, nothing slick, nothing moister. <laughs> I prefer my oyster fried. Then I'm sure my oysters die. So I did another book called Alphabetta Juice, and um, and I got then you know the term meta meta narrative. I thought I'd get it off into some serious critical terms. So I talked about meta narrative, but I talked about it in the com context of pig and possum troll. I'll try to explain that. Uh, the meta narrative is the cultural assumptions underlining a story. Uh, in the postmodern era, we're meant to go, yeah, right, to I mean, yeah, right, to moral frameworks, to be radically skeptical of meta narratives. And then I quoted something. Uh, thinkers like Alice Kalinikos and Jürgen Habermas argue that Jean-Francois Biotard's description of the postmodern world as containing an incredulity, incredulity toward meta narratives could be seen as a meta narrative in itself. According to this view, post-structural thinkers like Leotard criticize universal rules but postulate that post-modernity contains a universal skepticism toward meta-narratives, and this universal skepticism is in itself a contemporary meta-narrative, like a post-modern neo-romanticist meta-narrative that intends to build up a meta-critic or meta-discourse and a meta-belief holding up that Western, holding up the Western science it just, uh, it goes on and on and on. Uh, that would seem to cover everything. But what if, for the life of you, you can find no meta-narrative in a story? Some years back, I wrote a book about being a Southerner in the North. As I trudged from city to city, trying to induce people to buy that book, I was called upon to explain what non-Southerners regarded as characteristically Southern phenomena. In Wellesley, Massachusetts, a lady handed me a printout of this part. Headline, Man Fined for Tossing Pig Over Hotel Counter. Associated Press. West Point, Mississippi, December 7th. <laughs> when pigs fly, indeed. Kevin Pugh, 20, of Cedar Bluff, has been fined $279 for tossing a pig over the counter at the Holiday Inn Express in West Point on November the 12th. Pugh pleaded guilty Tuesday in city court to a charge of disturbing the peace. West Point Police Lieutenant Danny McCaskill has said Pugh didn't know the employees of the hotel, and there is no evidence, his surprise, no evidence intoxication was involved. No one was hurt, including the pig. <laughs> this was the silliest thing I've ever seen, McCaskill said. Almost every officer we had was involved because the incidents kept happening at different hours. McCaskill said Q was accused of walking into the hotel and throwing the 60-pound pig over the counter. He said it was a prank, McCaskill said. Must be some redneck thing, because I haven't ever heard of anything like it. McCaskill said there, there have been four late-night incidents involving animal tossing at West Point. <laughs> Twice a pig was tossed, and two of the incidents involved possums. <laughs> All four of the disturbances took place between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., McCaskill said. Pugh is accused in a second animal throwing incident at a Hardee's restaurant. <laughs> he has pleaded innocent to disturbing the peace in that case. The lady who handed me this article said, why would they do that? <laughs> I was tempted to make something up. This man undoubtedly belongs to SPOT, S-P-O-T, I could have told her. Society of Pig and Opossum Throat. <laughs> they do a lot of good things, too. They raise money for new fire engines and so on, and most of the throwing is ceremonial and open to the public. <laughs> they throw pigs and possums back and forth to each other, and it is something to see. Especially the catch and release action, which must be accompanied accomplished in one motion, so the tossed animal will not get its bearings and bite the receiver. Hot possum, they will cry, or hot pig. Up north, I believe the game is watered down to hot potato. Good indication of the difference between north and south. 
But some spot members, if they don't get to bed early enough, are bad to indulge on occasion in what might be seen as extracurricular pig or possibly problem. <laughs> but saying that would have contributed to misunderstanding between the regions. I assured the lady that this story, to the best of my knowledge, was an isolated instance, or okay, a series of isolated instances, <laughs> not amounting to a trend or custom. She wasn't satisfied. She looked at me as though she felt I was covering something up. <laughs> Maybe I should have just said, y'all don't ever pay a hotel bill that way? <laughs> <laughs> Truth is, I was curious about the story myself, so I did some Google. That news story, it turns out, circulated internationally. Here is the Romanian version. Pork got intra in the hotel. <laughs> Kevin Pugh in Varsta the 20 honey, then Cedar Bluff, a primit o amenda I won't read the whole thing. <laughs> uh, and uh, here is the Slovenian translation. As Pult de Virgil de Vega Prosica. American Kevin Hughes, Jamal Pacati, 279, Dollarjev, Kozny, Sarati, Henry. Polisiski, Nailnik, Danny McCaskill, Jeff Provedal. Evidently, the word for possum is similar in Romanian and Slovenian, possumi, but uh, pig appears to be quite different from two words. Um, no Kevin Pugh is listed in the Cedar Bluff area, according to information, so we may never know what motivated him in these acts. These acts. Or I should say in or I should say in this act, because we don't know that he was the perpetrator of more than the one throne. It is even possible that no possums were thrown, since you'll notice that the story says only that possums were involved. <laughs> Which is not to imply that the possums were the brains behind it. <laughs> I once asked Basil Clark, who organized the Possum Growers Benevolent Association in Clanton, Alabama, whether a possum was intelligent. He is if he has to be, <laughs> said Clark. He'd rather just mosey along. <laughs> when all is said and done, however, I wonder myself what Mr. Pugh was thinking, other than just pig, hotel desk. Hot damn! <laughs> I believe we will. Uh, um, uh, then I get off in postmodernism again, but um, <laughs> but here's what I have a hard time figuring that this animal thro throwing story has any meta narrative at all, unless there is one possibility. I am by no means implying any sort of complicity here, but it just could be that the meta narrative of the animal throwing is an effort to establish internationally, and credibly as far as I'm concerned, that there is a police lieutenant in West Point, Mississippi, who is not a redneck. <laughs> not the redneck. Danny McCaskey. He's a great culprit. 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 Of the word. I have a little piece about each letter of that. Uh, oh, for instance. The last sentence in the OED's uh, lengthy discussion of the letter O's development is this. We fancy, frequent in authors of the 16th and 17th century, that the shape of the letter O represented the rounded shape of the mouth in forming the sound can be seen from the history of the letter to be without foundation in fact. I uh, argue with that right now. Um, but, uh, I'm joking, you're talking about the, uh, um, but anyway, and then I have stories in here about uh, writing and uh, the, uh, you know, it was a, I went to make a speech some years ago in, in Western Pennsylvania, and the guy picked me up the alphabet, picked me up the alphabet, picked me up the airport, <laughs> and drove me to the place where I was uh, to make the speech. Um, we were driving along this alphabet somewhere in the woods, some kind of encampment, I don't know. But uh, we were driving along, and he said, uh, we're, oh, we're driving right near Gettysburg right now. 
And I said, uh, and I said to myself, that doesn't seem right. I don't think Gettysburg is around here. And he said, and you know, you know, they spent the winter there and uh, just wrapped their, didn't have any shoes, just wrapped their feet up in rags. And we complained today. And I realized, oh, he had it confused with Valley Forge. Went along for a while and I saw a sign in front of the house that said Barb's, B A R B, B Barb's Fine Pies. And uh, I said, Oh, they sell pies out of their houses here? They said, Yeah, well, there are a lot of people around here that sell pies. And that woman there has got a particularly sells beautiful pie. She uh, sells these lemon meringue pies, and the meringue alone is about that big. He said, It's as big as a chef's hat. <laughs> And I thought, well, you know, that's not very much meringue on a pie that can be compared to a toke. And uh, so he went along and then he said, started talking about his wife, and he said, uh, you know, uh, I made her a valentine. And we, uh, I, I took, uh, cut out a heart, and, and then I bent a uh, coat hanger into an arrow, and I ran that heart right through the middle of that arrow. But that's an odd sort of way to put it. I guess you could say he was bringing the heart through the arrow. And he said, yeah, uh, she was a lot smarter than I was in school. She, in fact, she was a hoo-hoo. And I said, I'm sorry? A hoo-hoo? What's a hoo-hoo? And he said, you know, hoo-hoo. Hoo-hoo's in American uh, college. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Never met anybody who was dyslexic, and whose dyslexia extended as far as pie. <laughs> um, I, I was always in, in first grade. I was always a little dyslexic myself. I always uh, uh, got the letters backwards and things, and I always thought that gave me a little twist that uh, uh, helped me focus on words a little, a little harder. But anyway, um, so and, and you go. And, but then I went on and did a, a second word book called Alpha. Well, that's the second one. Well, the first word book has um, God's taste. Uh, there's a lot of stories about in here about writing I have done. And, for, and the differences between little word, how the difference between one little word can make a big difference. I wrote a story with Wilt Chamberlain some years ago when I was uh, at Sports Illustrated. Uh, they assigned me to go out to Bel Air, California to write a story with Wilt Chamberlain. He was announcing his retirement from, as a player in basketball. And uh, Wilt Chamberlain was a huge man. I don't know, he, he died uh, a few years ago, but he was about he was seven, supposedly seven feet tall, but I think a little taller than that. And he had little narrow ankles and he just got bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> and, uh, um, once I was in, in the elevator with him and I turned to answer something he asked me and I realized I was looking at his elbow. It was the same like just as much of Wilt above my eye level as it was below. Um, but we worked together fine. I, I don't want to disillusion you about athletes in general, but some of them, they're not all very literary. Uh, Pete Rowe, you know, he used to play for the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, some reason somebody asked him how many books he had ever read. And he gave that question some due consideration and said, finally, I don't think I've ever read a book. And they said, Pete, you've written two. I don't know how to read them either. Uh, so, but Will, I don't know, Will is not only a big man, but he had this sort of giant, uh, gigantic, uh, myth mythic, uh, Reputation. For instance, in a uh, he wrote a memoir in which he alleged that he had slept with twenty thousand women. <laughs> a friend of mine uh, was the editor of that book, and after the manuscript came in, he called Wilt up and said, "Well, uh, we're doing the math here <laughs> 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 uh, on a day-to-day -day basis." Uh, and we all said, yeah, well, I understand, I, I really it had sounds that way, but there was this one big birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, what, what really impressed me would be, apparently he broke up with 20,000. <laughs> but 
he, um, at any rate, he, but we got along fine. I mean, he, he was, uh, some people, even some people who are good talkers don't speak in prose. You know, they, they talk, they sound good, but a lot of it is, uh, is gestures and intonations and everything. But Wilt spoke uh, quite, um, you know, you could write down what he said and it went ten on the page. And I just had to fiddle with it a little bit. And um, it worked out fine. We got along fine. Unfortunately, he had um, done a story like this and has told the story for Sports Illustrated earlier in his basketball career. And um, he had felt misrepresented by the headline. Uh, and so he was, he had, part of the, the deal was that he had to approve not only every word in the body of the story, but every word in the headline. So, and he, you know, it was this huge, you know, the ceilings were much higher than this. He was, uh, it was this house up in Bel Air, up in the hills, and uh, it was just tall enough for him to live in. And um, <laughs> it had this odd feature of uh, interior decorating that I've never seen anywhere else, which was wolf muscles. Apparently his uh, decorator had gotten a hold somehow of a truckload of, of leaves <laughs> off of wolves. I'm sure they were roadkill wolves or something. I don't know. But he had wolf muzzle uh, upholstery and wolf muzzle carpets and so there are all these wolf muzzles there. And there are also several of his friends there who were there to keep him from being taken advantage of by me. You know, they weren't as tall as he was, but they were tall enough to be his friends. And they, uh, <laughs> they were so, you know, walking around and watching me for one false move. They didn't want to to be misrepresented again. So uh, I was there, and uh, in those days, this was quite a while ago, we didn't have uh, fax machines and much less uh, computers. We just had a button and story would go. You had to, you had this thing that Hunter Thompson called a mojo machine, which is a you hook it up to a telephone, a big heavy thing, hook it up to a telephone, and you put a page of typed copy in it, and it would gradually transmit it to a, another Mojo machine at the other end. And um, we were waiting for the story to come in through these machines from New York, where it was being kept. And the story came through, you know, and read the whole story page by page, it was fine. And then the main headline, Came through, which was uh, they came through and I passed it up to Will to uh, <laughs> and, uh, the main headline was quote my impact will be everlasting, which was fine with him. He had in fact, in fact said that word for word, and he thought it was commensurate with his stature, so that was good. But then the subject came in on the slow wheel machine. I pulled it up, and I could see that they. Um, might be a problem. So I hand it up to him. So here it was, a dominant force in basketball announces his retirement from the game. And Wilt read that and said, a dominant force. And I said, well, you know, I think that the operative words there are dominant and force. And he, was saying, he said, a dominant force. And, uh, his friends are already beginning to move around and they'll say, hey, Dominic, hey, Dominic, what are you, hey, Dominic, you wouldn't call it Ada. And uh, I said, you apparently, apparently would like it to be the Dominant? And he said, yes, so, the Dominant. But unfortunately, I could see that that wasn't going to fit. <clears throat> but, so I called back to uh, the office at Sports Illustrated back in New York. Uh, and we had a telephone operator there named Muriel, who was a miraculous telephone operator. She was like a White House. The White House has these people who can just track people down somehow and find them and tap uh, and get them into the, uh, the phone conversation somehow or another, wherever they are. And Muriel was not only really good, she uh, knew she was really good and didn't take any guff off of anybody. We had a, uh, an imperious French managing editor named Andre Leguet, who had been Charles de Gaulle's information officer during World War II. And Leguerre one time slammed the phone down and uh, his phone and uh, it rang immediately and picked it up and it was Muriel. And 
doing it said, Andrew, if everyone in the building pranged his receiver, I would have to have brain surgery. <laughs> he never wanged his receiver again. But anyway, uh, so Muriel found the editor I had to talk to about this headline, but she found him where I was afraid she would find him, which was in a Chinese restaurant called The Hobo, which had two, not a very good Chinese restaurant, but it had two features that recommended it to us. Uh, one was that it, um, uh, it was right around the corner from the Time of Life building where Sports Illustrated was, and it also had a policy that every fourth drink was free. <laughs> <laughs> Which meant, if you think about it, it didn't hardly pay not to have eight. <laughs> when we reached this uh, editor, um, he, he was he picked up the phone and uh, said, I'm here with Wilt, Wilt and uh, we, we, everything's fine with the story, but the subhead, Wilt doesn't want, want to be a dominant for us, he wants to be the dominant. And the editor answered me in a way that was all the more frustrating because it almost sounded like human speech. But it was like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And meanwhile, Wilt's friends were moving around, you know, saying things like, Ada, what the man was saying? I can't see if you come into a man's home and call him Ada. You know? <laughs> Wolf muzzles were bristling up on me. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, I'm sorry, I can't get in. Every now and then a Chinese waiter would uh, somehow the voice would come in and say, who you want? You know? So I couldn't get anywhere. And I said, well, you're going to have to talk to this editor. So I handed the phone up to him and said, yeah, no chairman here. Um, uh, no, but the problem is, I know Donald, I know, of course, well, but the difference, there was between A dominant and well, I know, I see. And to my astonishment, I was hearing Wilt Mall. And uh, he finally agreed to that letter. He handed me the phone back and I hung up and he said, Who the hell is Muriel? <laughs> <laughs> Always uh, hope that Muriel will kick in when I'm uh, writing and that will help me out. Um, um, so I did a, a show in New York one time, and um, well, I just got up and talked for two hours, right? an hour and a half, and um, I wasn't sure I was ready for the New York theater. So I, um, you know, you see singers and uh, musicians on the subway, they go out and you know, sort of break in like that. So I thought maybe I would break in my act on the subway. So I went to the subways and got up and was about to do a monologue when I noticed that there was a couple there who were awfully striking because they were they were had black leather on all over and yet you had the sense that they were covered with uh, lizard tattoos because you could see the tail of a lizard kind of disappearing in here and the head of a lizard coming out here but they were having a kind of a uh, conversation that couples who aren't teaming with lizards <laughs> he was saying to her, you don't share your life with your family. And she said, what do you mean? What don't, I, what don't I say? What don't I tell you about? He said, I tell you about everything, but I have to hear about what you do from other people. And she said, what? What are you talking about? What, what, do, what have I not talk, told you about? And he said, well, um, how about Francesco? And she said, oh, well, I thought you knew about Francesco, oh, uh, he was just a very nice man, one of the first people I met when I came to town. And the guy said, see, see, that's a, exactly what I mean. I pick a name out of the air. <laughs> 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 Who the hell is Francesco? <laughs> so uh, I couldn't compete with that. So I just went over there and did, did my show, but I stopped about halfway through and threw the floor open for questions. And I make a lot of plays can be approved by question from the audience. For instance, Othello. After, if there were questions from uh, after a couple of acts, a tragedy might be averted. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that. So I thought perhaps this is a good moment in the uh, to throw the floor open for questions over anything that we have covered or not covered. 
anybody got any questions? Why have you never written about Gerald Ford? Well, I, I, well, Gerald Ford didn't last very long, and somehow or another I didn't have a, a uh, uh, any place to write about it. You know, I, I didn't have a column or anything, for that reason. I'd love to write about Gerald Ford. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, you know, for most presidents, I have had a column or some kind of thing about this book. I've been registered like a vote. I've been a columnist at that time. Which is, I don't think they are for it. Mine is one way or the other. Yeah? How was the Wait Wait experience? Wait Wait, don't tell me experiences. Uh, you go to, usually to Chicago, but sometimes to other cities. And on Thursday night, they tape the, uh, tape in front of a live audience. And um, it's fun to do. It's been going on now since, about 14 years, I guess, and it took a while for it to catch on. But it's the most popular and unfortunately among the least lucrative things I've ever been involved in. <laughs> so, so, but it's great. We go over there and it's, uh, it's, an, it's sort of like basketball in a way in the sense that, uh, you know, Peter Sagan brings the ball down the court and uh, somebody will take a shot and then because it's edited later, you can sort of just say something stupid and keep the ball, <laughs> ball in the air, and then maybe somebody will think of something funny. And uh, so we've had you know, all kinds of distinct. We used to just have like, NPR people as our guests, but then we, were, we had Obama back when he was a senator. And uh, he came on and, and, he, and said, uh, at one point he said, uh, he was uh, surprised to find when he got uh, into the Senate that. Every senator had a little desk, like in you know, whatever suit. And, it, and the senators over the centuries had carved their names into the desk. And uh, I said, what are you supposed to do that? And he said, well, I, I thought it was the only African American senator, I'm not a senator, I might spray paint. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it, 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 yeah. What's Garrison Keeler really like? <laughs> I don't know. I've only known him for 30 years. So. <laughs> Garrison Keeler is very tall and, uh, and um, you know, he talks about being a shy person, and he still is so shy person. He's, uh, he'll be very nice to your sister, you know, things like that. But if, if he, uh, if he comes over, He's a much better host than he is a You know, he's just uh, one time he would say things like, we don't mingle with him. Yeah, so he's, uh, uh, don't invite him to a cocktail party with a lot of trendy guests. And then, uh, have him come over and see your sister. <laughs> he's a good, good, solid folks if it's just you and your sister. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, Has your method changed at all since computers came out, or is it the same as it always has? Question is, um, <clears throat> now that with new technology coming out all the time, do I find it harder or easier to write a book and use uh, my, my method change uh, with new technology? Uh, I, I'm unable physically to operate the old typewriter, the old standard typewriter that I wrote several, not many months ago. This head taught me touch type of the uh, eighth grade, so I was in touch type, but it's, I mean, it's hard to push those keys down. So I've been writing on a computer now for a number, I never could write on an electric typewriter because I would put my fingers down on the keys and I would skip the electric typewriter, but I, it certainly, but when I was writing on a typewriter, um, I did more drafts and you'd have to retype the sentence, I don't know, whereas Right on the computer, it's sort of like finger paint. You, know, you, sort of, you just sort of do anything you want to. But, but, uh, so, yeah. it, it is great to be, when you get a book written, it's on your machine, 
Then you just hit a button and it goes to the motor. And that's much better than bailing it off. So there's a lot to be said for that, but uh, I don't tweet. Uh, I don't do Facebook. I don't, I never have gotten involved in all that stuff. Now, more and more, the book seems like some kind of incidental thing where people want to meet the author. You know, and to me, it's all about the book, with the author. And, you know, people want to uh, um, go to your Facebook page and, uh, and chat with you. And I just, I, I'm not that ready to chat. Um, so I, I don't do all that. I may have to start doing it. So. And the whole book business is a really terrible thing. Uh, people steal them one day. You, know, you can go, you can go these, uh, to these sites where you can sign up. I'm not going to tell you the name of it. You can probably go in. Or you can just get sign up for $60 and you can get any book, in a, any book that's been scanned and, and stolen for free. A lot of movies and uh, TV shows and music. And uh, I, was, I saw a... a T-shirt in New Orleans uh, in the window recently. It said, it was a picture of a motorcycle, and it said, ride it like you stole it. <laughs> so I thought it was something cool. But I think if you're going to steal books, you ought to read them like you stole it. <laughs> <laughs> so the wind in your hair scares the death of you. Almost would like readers like that. But, uh, um, anyway, so it, that's a problem. Um, you know, it, it just what books consist of anymore is, you know, e-books are just different, I think, and uh, it's getting, you know, Amazon wants every book to e-book to sell for $9.99, because that they, Amazon will buy books from the publisher for $12.99 and sell them for $9.99 so that they can um, sell their Kindles. You know, it's all about selling the, the device, not the books. And, uh, so, and then meanwhile, Amazon's sort of taking over publishing. So they're publishing their own books. And um, uh, it's a, publishers are running, running scared. And so uh, it's harder and harder to get people to publish because it's, uh, it, it just kind of gets tossed out there. And, uh, and, it's, and the bookstores are, are folding. And uh, bookstores are always such a, when you, you write a book, it's in a store, and then you can go there, and you can sign it, and you can talk to people about it. But if there are no bookstores, it all just becomes Facebook and Amazon. Uh, in some ways, that's more efficient. But uh, I, I love to browse in a bookstore. You know, I mean, if you can browse online, but not the same way. You don't. Be, you have to be sort of looking. You can find what you're looking for online, but you don't find what you're not looking for. That's why I always, always uh, wanted to find. Uh, so, I don't know, it's uh, it's evolving and I keep getting older and, uh, and uh, I, think, uh, people, I think people in general now spend so much of their time trying to figure out how to use the, the new operating system on their new device that uh, that, instead of uh, learning from a book, they're learning about how to, uh, how to read the book from the, from the not from the manual, it doesn't say the manual anymore. Or um, but learning how to, and I really get tired of learning how to use new devices. I don't want to use new devices. I like my iPad, I got an iPhone, I got a little thin computer, a lot of that. But, um, and after a while, you uh, wonder if it's not all about the devices instead of the Anybody else? Yeah. When did you first decide to write about the Mars program? I, um, I wrote this little book called uh, about, about Sue. It's always one of my favorite movies. And um, there was an editor who was going to have a series of books about where an author picked something he or she really wanted to write about and they wrote about it. one subject. And, uh, so I said, well, I'll write about Doug Sue. Okay. <laughs> I wrote, spent a lot of time watching Duck Soup over and over and slowing it down and, and using my uh, computer to stop it and back it up. And, uh, the great thing was I've got this big monitor and I would have the, the movie up over here, you know, from the DVD movie. I could watch the movie and write about it at the same time. So, but anyway, I just always loved that. So when I first went up to New York, from, I grew up in the Cayman, Georgia, and, and I won a scholarship to Vanderbilt, Rambler Rice Sports Club. 
which had summer jobs in, in New York at the morning television, the racing but, uh, and I would go to this um, old theater called The Theater and see old movies. And one of the first ones I saw was Duck Soup, which is just a crazy movie. There's just no, there's no, you know, social message or anything. It's uh, and it doesn't, most of Marx Brothers movies have a sappy uh, love story that you have to suffer through for the sake of comedy. <laughs> Duck Soup, and nobody's in love with anybody except for, And it's just all bang, 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 bang. And I just always you know, fancied it. And so I watched it over and over and I read up on the Marsh Brothers and just dug up. I like to do things like that. Just take a topic and just see what I, what I can find. Uh, toss it all together and uh, And uh, so that's what I, I did. I like to write it, but I love doing it sometimes. I don't know, it was just an opportunity where a publisher wanted me to do something with that. Jump on. Anybody else? Well, I'll, uh, let me read you this thing. Uh, I don't know which book I have to queue that. Um, uh, um, this uh, goes back to the orality of language. Um, Eating is like reading and writing. Eating goes hand in hand with talking. Folks I grew up with talked while they ate about what they were eating. When several sides and generations of the family of such folks sat down together around the table with 10 or 12 generous platters of food in front of them, they sounded like this. The rest of our service, they did. Pitch in. Oh, I don't know where to start first. <laughs> Hmm. Big Mama has outdone herself tonight. <laughs> well, I just hope y'all can enjoy it. I believe I could eat a horse. But you look at them tomatoes. Woo! Don't they look good? Now, Tatum, slow down. You let that child enjoy himself. <laughs> well, you think we didn't feed him at home? He didn't get any snap beans. Lord, pass that child some snap beans. Lila, how about you over there? You need something more. Butter beans? <coughs> well, no. I'm working in this corn. Come on, just a day. Well, you taught me into it. Mm -hmm. Awful early to be getting this good of corn. Eulene, would you send that over back around? Look at me, just a putting it away. I'm eating like a field hand. A little more tea to wash it down? Mm -hmm. These greens. Anybody want anything? Well, I will have one more half of that squash if nobody minds. It's so good. A little cornbread to stop that juice. One more mouthful of ham, then I do have to stop. Enough. Look at all that chicken left. Have a little more there, Per Farrell. Well, where would you put it? Uh-huh, and just a spoonful of that gravy to put on my peas. Farrell, we didn't raise you to put gravy on your peas. Now see, you let that child eat the way he likes it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More rolls, anybody? I think this is all I can hold. You better eat some more of this good chicken. No, I got the same room for pie. There's pie? Oh, listen, pie? Now, Needy, you know good and well we wouldn't let y'all go back home and tell folks we didn't serve you in pie. <laughs> Look at that pie. What is in this pie? This pie is so good. Um, mm. How do you get your crust to do like this, Big Mama? My crust won't do like this to save my life. Oh, I've had your crust. Your crust does fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I have eaten myself sick. Ooh, ooh. Wasn't that good? I don't think I could touch another bite. I'm about to pop. Ooh. Yes, Lord. The tomatoes are especially good. Got plenty more now I could slice right up. Ooh, no, I'd die. <laughs>